Hi, I'm Tracy. I'm April. And, and this, this is Killer Spirits. Good. Happy Valentine's Day. Happy Valentine's Day. <laughs> it's a day. I feel like we haven't recorded in so long. <laughs> it feels like ages. It does. So everyone who was patient with us, thank you. We missed last week at a funeral to go to. So it was um, sad. It was a sad thing. So anyway, uh, yeah. So that's why we didn't record, but we are back with we're, a vengeance. We're back, baby. Yeah, and you're getting two this week. So we're making it up to you. This week. <laughs> two this week. Sometimes we randomly do two and you don't know yeah, that it's coming, but we just, it, it all we're depends. telling you, check back on Wednesday. That's right. There we're telling you this one. week. There will be another one. Um, happy Valentine's Day. Yeah, we said that. Blah, blah, blah. Valentine's oh, Day. Yeah, yeah, yeah. In honor of Valentine's Day, we're doing a Valentine's <laughs> Day murder. That's right. Okay. That's what I was Thank you. To. Now you've made Valentine's Day nice. <laughs> it was, it's kind of sad. Oh. I was rereading the stuff this morning and I was like, I hope Eric would never do that to me. Oh my gosh. I don't think he'll ever murder me. I think we're fine. Oh, good. That's good to know. I'll probably save. I'm not like a huge fan of Valentine's Day. I mean, I have nothing against it and I really like buying candy for my kids and stuff. Mm -hmm. But um, it's fun when you're a kid. Yeah, it's fun when you're a kid. But yeah, I mean, just show me you love me all year, okay? Yeah. Just just take me out other days, not Valentine's Day, because the rest of the world is on a Valentine's mm -hmm. Day, and I'd rather, you know, go out when it's not Valentine's Day. Yeah, I'm like the opposite of people, where if I go to a place and, like, even, like, drive through fast food, if the line's too long, I'm like, fuck this. No. I'll I'm leave. Done. Yeah. And I know people are like, oh my gosh, when there's tons of people there, you know so it's good. Popular. And it's like, yeah, but I don't want to go with tons of people. No. <laughs> I don't like tons even of people. Even pre-COVID. Don't sit by me. No nothing he'll know i know and i'm sorry but i'm not gonna like say what airline it is because i'm sure there's many airlines that are doing this but flying sucks right now and we i had a full flight full literally we were packed in there like sardines i'm like do people not realize it's covid right now like what is happening yeah i wonder if they if there's like you know because they can kind of tell where things are coming from i wonder if airlines are like airplanes are a spreader I don't think they're a huge spreader. Which I've is read so that they're weird. not because but I how guess could they not be the ventilation? Oh yeah. I mean, I guess if everyone's keeping their masks on the whole time, but I'm sorry, people do not know how to wear their masks. And also, and I don't think eating. masks are 100 percent a savior. No, they're not. But yeah. also, people are taking them off to eat, and suddenly that's okay. But I just don't get it. Anyway, blah blah blah. So we have to wear them all day at work. Yeah. And I will, unless we're eating or drinking, and I will literally like just have a bottle here in front of me and just like keep a straw out. You're one of those on people. my desk. <laughs> <laughs> like if I need to just like take a breath and get it off my face. Sometimes you just feel like you're going to suffocate. Like, <laughs> okay, well I guess I just have to drink my coffee now because yeah, especially if you like take the stairs. Yeah. Forget about it. Taking a flight of stairs with a freaking mask on. I know. No way. By the time I get to the top, I'm like, <gasps> I'm, like sucking the mask into my mouth. <laughs> I just feel like a fucking idiot. And can I just say I don't know if we have any Texas listeners. Hi, Texas. I love your state. Hey, Texas. But your weather, and I was born in Texas. I'm just going to say. So y'all. I did live there, y'all, for like your four weather. years of my life. And I used to go there in summers. But your weather is fucking bonkers it's bananas. Up. Two times I've gone to Texas and it was beautiful. It was sunny. And the forecast said it was going to stay that way. I did not pack cold weather clothing. And then the cold snap, as you guys like to say. <laughs> is that what they say? Yeah. I think they call it a snap. It snapped me. It came and man, my little toesies were freezing. One time I had to go to Target and get like actual pants and shoes and socks. Oh. Yeah. It always surprises me. I should learn my lesson, actually. I when feel I like the whole time I was ever in Texas, when I lived there, it was hot as balls. Yeah. But it can get really fucking cold really fast. Yeah. I never got any of those nice days. I don't know if they're nice. It's cold. Yeah. Even when it was like cloudy and like raining, it was still fucking hot. Yeah. Maybe I just lived there during a hot year. I think you did. I don't know. Because it's gotten cold twice for me. But anyway. Anyway. 
I do love that. uh I do love that Austin culture though. It's really nice. I've never been to Austin. It's it's really cool. You you would like it. And I gotta give a shout out to anyone who knows about kolaches because kolaches are the best fucking thing that ever happened to mm. me. And the pastries. Oh my gosh. <laughs> Savory and sweet, but I really like the sweet ones. Mm. And you cannot find a kolache in California to save your fucking life. Can you order them online? You can, but it's like 40 something dollars shipping. Oh, no. So I think we're actually, that should be our next venture, that we should start a kolache shop. Kolaches. Because no one in California knows what they are. Oh. We'd make bank. I bet I can make them. But I need some Czechoslovakian people to come help me. Because I don't know the recipe. I just know it's the most amazing oh. thing on the planet. We could find some. Yeah, let's do it. Any Czech people hit us up. Ch- hey, come on. I'm going into business <laughs> with you guys. I might eat all our product, but, but it's happening. You know, we'll taste test it. <laughs> All right, so should we talk about our cocktails? Yeah, today? talk about our cocktails. I'm really, really excited about it. It's so pretty. Make sure you go to Instagram and check it out mm-hmm. because the, I don't know. I think this is like one of the prettiest ones we've done. Oh, I it's could beautiful. Be wrong, but it's. I mean, it is Valentine's. This is the called Bloody Oubliette. Was pretty. Oh, that's true. That was. Yeah. So this is my Bloody Valentine that we created, mm. and it is very red, very bloody looking. Sweet and delicious. Sweet and delicious. So, Valentine's Day. Let's talk a little bit about that. Because, I, I mean, we all celebrate it, but do you really know the history of no, behind No, no clue. Not really. So, back in the day, the Romans used to celebrate the Feast of Lupercalia, which I'm probably totally saying wrong. Lupercalia? Lupercalia, from February 13th to February 15th. And the men sacrificed a dog and a goat. And then after Why this, sacrifice the dog. I don't know. They sacrificed shit all the oh. time back then. And after, uh, yeah, after this, the hides of the animals were used by men to whip women. Whipping them. We're whipping the women. That's where Fifty Shades of Grey started. <laughs> it started on Valentine's <laughs> Day. And so young women even lined up to be whipped by men because they believed it made them more fertile. I wonder if that's like a modern day deep psychology thing. I don't know, but that doesn't sound very fun. I, I've never been whipped with a hide. I, was gonna say, but I don't know about you, but I am not into whipping. <laughs> yeah. So I, I don't identify with that, but some people do. I'm not kink shaming. No, not at all. I'm just saying. Um, and also during the celebrations, a matchmaking lottery was also held, and men picked out names of women from a box and proceeded to profess their love to these women during the festival. So isn't that romantic? You know, your throwback Tinder. Hey. You swipe and is it right or left? Box. Which is the good way. You swipe right or you right. swipe... Oh, okay. I think right is good. I don't know. I've never done Tinder. I'm too old. I, uh, yeah. This sometimes did culminate in a marriage, so... Hey. Yeah. And then Lupercalia was replaced by St. Valentine's Day by the end of the 5th century by Pope Gelasius. Mm. And this was part of the reason that led to Valentine's Day being associated with romance as well as the beginning of love. So St. Valentine is the love saint? Yeah. Yeah, it's been named after St. Valentine, who was a priest, Mm -hmm. who believed to have secretly helped Christian couples get married, and this was a move against the Roman Emperor Claudius II, because the emperor did not allow men to get married, because he felt that um, single men were better and more dedicated soldiers. I mean, that's probably true. They weren't distracted. It's probably true. Yeah. So all you soldiers out there, you probably shouldn't be getting married. You're distracted. Stay single. (laughs) (laughs) I don't know. I feel like you find more distraction when you're single. Oh, that might actually be true. (laughs) All right. I closed my phone and I wanted to tell you guys the Mm. recipe. So the recipe that we have today, this is our Bloody Valentine. It's really, really good. First, you're going to fill your shaker with ice and then you're going to put in... Two ounces of sweetened lime juice, which I was an idiot and thought, oh, I'll just take some lime juice and put sugar in it. Apparently, you can buy this shit. Okay, it's Rose's, people. Rose's, it, Rose's yeah, brand. Rose's brand. I didn't know that. I learned something new every day. So use that. You're going to use four ounces of raspberry vodka, four ounces of cranberry juice cocktail, and two ounces of grenadine. This is both of those. The cranberry juice and the grenadine are going to give it that beautiful red color. Mm. And then you're going to uh, shake it up really, really good, put it in your glass. It does taste good this way. Just this way. It, it tastes it's like, like a popsicle. A melted popsicle. Mm-hmm. It really does. When you said that, I was you like. You said Kool-Aid and that was pretty straight. Like, yeah. Pretty but I think too. melted popsicle was more accurate. Mm-hmm. It does. So it is good. But if you really like a super sweet drink, if you're not into a super su- sweet drink, which, you know, I'm not. That was really sweet. Yeah. 
we floated about, what do you think? Three ounces? Yeah, probably. Yeah, three ounces of Prosecco on the top. Dried which it out a little bit. Gave it a little bit of dryness. It's just sweet enough. It's got a little bit of a bubbly, mm-hmm. just a tiny bit of mouth. Just some effervescence. Effervescence on there. <laughs> <laughs> and then you garnish with uh, some raspberries. Or you can take some strawberries and cut them into little hearts. Cute. We missed the boat on that one. But that's nah, okay. I think our raspberries look really pretty. One of our raspberries is shaped like a heart. It so really was. Go to Instagram, Killer Spirits Pod, and look at it. Yeah, and we got some really cute. cute little skewers that are shaped like diamonds. Diamonds. It looks so bougie today. It really is. It, with our new glasses. Yeah, and we got these glasses. I think the stems are like 12 inches high. They're so fucking tall. <laughs> I love them. I'm obsessed with them. Like, I think, like, they're definitely supposed to be cocktail glasses, right? Yeah, what else would they be? Wine glasses. Whatever. We make whatever we But want. they're not shaped like wine glasses. They're not shaped like wine glasses at all. But they're tall like that. Yeah. They're really pretty. So this was a fun drink to make. And it's, it's delicious. Very festive. Very festive. So we didn't whip anyone with hides, but, no. you know. We didn't pick anybody's name. Maybe from next a box. year. <laughs> Maybe next year. Maybe we'll get Eric to volunteer. Oh, we can whip him? Uh-huh. <laughs> He'll have to whip you. Mm-mm. Make you fertile. I don't think I need that. The face that you just made. <laughs> if only people could no, see thank it. Thank you. You did this little like shaky thing with your nose all scrunched up. Like, no. <laughs> um, yeah, one of these days when we get our future podcast studio um up and running. Up and running. Yeah. Because currently we're in my regular work office, but I have plans for a podcast studio. I'm so excited. Um, once we get that up and running, we'll probably start doing video. Yeah. Oh, and you know what I'm dying to do? I really want to do a podcast in a cemetery. Okay. I, I know we've talked about on location before. I really feel like we need to figure out how to do this. It'd I feel be like so we can fun. figure out how to take all the shit with us. We can do it. We're doing it, people. Okay. I think also we could record it on our phones. I don't think the quality would be as good, but and we can do it. I'm figuring this out. Which cemetery? On location. We oh, actually, we went to for your birthday? Yeah, we have a really good cemetery in town that has yeah. been around since, what, the 1700s? It's old. It's really old, and it's massive. And we it's, took Yeah, it's yeah, huge. And we took a cemetery tour there. I don't know if we've talked about this before, maybe. I think so. It was a ghost tour. Yeah, it was really fun. I really liked it. And on Halloween, they have the lantern tours where you go at so night. So cute. Which we've never gotten because we're we're stupid and we go too late and all the tickets are sold out. Yeah. But someday. Someday. It's happening. I mean, that can't be canceled because of COVID, right? You're outside. They probably will cancel it. <sighs> they cancel everything. I know. Everything's canceled. Life is canceled, guys. Well, it's starting Except to come back. this podcast is not canceled. <laughs> it's starting to come back. But yeah, this podcast is not canceled. No. The things here. that I really, really enjoy aren't canceled. That's it's true. all the extra shit that I didn't really care about that's canceled. Yeah. Because I don't have any kids, so they're not in school. Oh, yeah. I have kids. That would be a big deal if I did have kids. It's kind of a big deal, yeah. <sighs> it's frustrating. Are they learning anything? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I don't, I'm past, only time I'm will literally tell. past caring at this point. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's all just about staying alive. <laughs> Pretty much. <laughs> just Doing the best through. we can. Yeah. Well, tell me about your story today. I actually, I'm excited because I am 100% in the dark. The only thing that I know is that you are doing a Valentine murder. And it's in Oklahoma. Oh, yeah. You did tell me that. That was it. I don't know anything else about this. So I'm I'm always excited when I get to sit here and sip and listen, which I'm going to do right now. Today's the day. Today is the day. All right. Okay. So today's episode... As you can see, because you've already clicked on it, it's called the Valentine's Day slang, <laughs> slaying clicked on it. <laughs> of Susan Hamilton. I'm clicking my drink onto my microphone. Oh my sorry. God. My syrup. And what do you call it? This drink is basically syrup and alcohol. It's basically just <laughs> syrup and liquor. I mean, you heard the recipe. Yeah. yeah no, it, it, it doesn't taste strong, but I feel like it is strong. Oh, it's strong. But it doesn't taste that way. You put, I mean, there's two ounces of vodka just in this one. Oh, shit. That's with fine. Prosecco. <laughs> All right. I know when you started like dumping the vodka in there, it's like, oh shit, (laughs) this is going to be a good one. It's going to be a good Valentine's Day. Okay. So this is going to bring your, bring down your Valentine's Day. Okay. My bad. Go. Okay. So John and Susan Hamilton were married in 1987. His full name is Dr. John Baxter Hamilton. And he was an accomplished OBGYN and surgeon who always showered his wife with affection and gifts. Mm. Starting with the Porsche bought her the day they were married. Wow. Not bad. 
I didn't get a Porsche on my wedding day. No. <laughs> Me either. Although, I think it would be also you buying yourself a Porsche. Because oh. once you're married, it's your money. Oh, right? that's true. Um, they went on fancy vacations, lived in a beautiful home, had lavish dinner parties, and according to their friends, they seemed to be very happy and very much in love. People even said that they were inseparable. Oh, okay. Um, and I will say, I didn't really talk about their ages in this, but they did get married later in life. So I think they were both in their, like, 40s. Okay. What year was this they got married? 1987 they got married. Oh, okay. So we're in the 80s. Okay, cool. Well, we're going to go to modern times. Oh, oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. Um, And I'll post a picture of her on her Instagram today, but she was so beautiful. Was she? Yes. She was, like, a perfect model of, like, a middle-aged, classy 80s lady. Oh. With, like, the pearls and the hair. Yeah. She's a brunette. Um, So he really lucked out with her because... He looks like your little side eye. That you just... He's just not. He looks like a little just fucking weasel. Really? Yeah. Wow. But he's a doctor. Yeah. And he seemed to really care about her and love her. Which is what really matters. But uh, OK, go. Yeah. <laughs> um, a nurse at his clinic described her as beautiful, vivacious, intelligent, and just a really neat lady. Aww. Which is such a cute thing to say. She's just a, neat a really lady. neat lady. Um, she said, I told some people at the clinic, I wish I had someone that would look at me the way John looks at Susan. Aww. She just felt they were very happy. Um, both John and Susan had children from previous relationships. Susan had a daughter and John had a son. Um, Dr. Hamilton ran an abortion clinic along with his regular OBGYN practice which brought him quite a bit of negative attention mm. because they were in conservative Oklahoma. Right. Um, which was a situation he later tries to use as his defense. So Susan managed mm. the, the abortion clinic a few days a week. She okay. was there two days a week. Um, what people didn't talk about much and what didn't come out until the investigation and trial is that their marriage was kind of on the rocks and probably facing an impending divorce. Oh. It's thought the reason for their most recent issues was because John had loaned his son a bunch of money without talking to Susan about it first. Oh yeah. That's not something you do in a marriage. Yeah. And then also John may have been cheating. That's also something you don't do in a marriage. Yeah. <laughs> um, so if he wasn't cheating, there were suggestions that he was because he was spending a lot of his time calling an exotic dancer that he had befriended. Oh dear Lord. And he did so. So Susan caught him calling this person. Yes. Yeah, she checked his phone records. Um, he had called her like 60 times. And this was like pre-cell phone days, obviously. No, this was current cell phone days. So we're like up to 2001. Oh, okay. So they got married yeah. in 1987, but now we're in 2001. So yes. they've been married a while. Yes. Okay. Like 14 years, I think. Okay. Um, you got the 14 year itch. I guess. <laughs> I guess. So uh, according to the phone records, he called her about 60 times back and forth. Um, the exotic dancer denied a relationship ever happened and that John was just her doctor. Um, hmm. he told Susan once she found out about the calls, um, I am just helping her. She got an abortion a few years before that from him and she needed, she didn't have any money. She needed medication. She was depressed. He was helping her. Sounds noble. Right. Probably is not true. Okay. Um, even though she denies involvement, he was probably just being a fucking creep, like stalker behavior. Oh, because so the exotic dancer wasn't into him. No. What was her name? Do we know? I do, but I didn't write it down. Oh, OK. It was I think it was a kind of sounded like a fake name. Oh, okay. anyway, like a dancer name. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but OK, so he she was kind of like, what the fuck? Yeah, I think she was kind of like, well, there's this doctor that's helping me. Well, true. Yeah. And he's but giving me free medication. A stalker is still and, a stalker. Right. So she denies any involvement. Um. So at this point, Susan knew John was cheating and this would have been the dissolution of their marriage because she was very unhappy. So she called her daughter, Angela, a few nights before Valentine's Day and Angela seemed she said she seemed very upset and very sad. Um, she also told her that she was really lonely, Aww. Um, which I mean, I guess if your husband's calling a, an exotic dancer 10 times a day. Yeah. That maybe you would feel kind of lonely. And maybe he just wasn't ever there. Yeah. I think he worked a lot too. Yeah. But they also said that like 
he would call her multiple times throughout the day. Like, I think he was kind of a control freak. I, that sounds more controlling. Not like I'm checking in because I, I love you. About you. Like, yeah. that's more like I'm checking in because I, I want to make sure I have control over what you're doing and what are you doing? Right. So Susan's mother also said during the investigation and trial that Susan often felt smothered by John. Like he was kind of obsessed with her. Oh, God. And while she loved him and they were very close, she felt like it was a bit much. He mm-hmm. called her constantly throughout the day and had they had scheduled lunch together a few times a week at his office. Which, out of context, doesn't seem that weird. But it turns out that he's a homicidal maniac. So okay. I, I had a feeling. It's kind of fucked up. I mean, if, you know, I'm at this podcast. Yeah. <laughs> There's going to be murder. I didn't think this was going to end happily. <laughs> no. Actually ends kind of annoyingly. Oh, no. Well, that's too bad. Not that annoying. Yeah. But it's just like, ugh, whatever. Um, you taking a sip? Yeah. <laughs> mm-hmm. So the morning of February 14th, 2001, Dr. Mm-hmm. Hamilton left for work at about 7 o'clock. Um, he had ordered an ornate display of red orchids for Susan to show his love for Valentine's Day. Oh, my God. This is like cute. That was two days after Jason and I started dating. Oh. Yeah. It's your date anniversary. Yeah, we just had our 20 year date anniversary. Do people actually celebrate that? No. I hope not. Um, he had several surgeries planned for that morning, but he had come home to check on his wife sometime in the late morning. He found her on the bathroom floor, naked, bludgeoned to death, and strangled with his neckties. What the fuck? There was blood absolutely everywhere. Oh. So, Dr. Hamilton. Initiated CPR and called 911. He told the 911 operator to send police and an ambulance that he thought his wife was dead and he was administering CPR. He sounded frantic in the call, asking them to come quickly and to hurry. So that's his story. Okay. When the police arrived, there were a few theories. It could have been a burglary, a random intruder, or an anti-abortion activist. Oh, who's trying to get back to, at him or something. Yes. Okay. Because they were having, constantly having protests at their abortion clinic. Yeah. She worked there two days a week. He was the doctor. Yeah. Um, just the week before Susan was murdered, a wanted poster had been left for Dr. Hamilton. It read, a reward in heaven will be bestowed on anyone contributing to bringing this murderer to justice. Oh, wow. With him on it. Um, and both John and Susan had received threatening phone calls that week. Okay. So now I could see why he's checking in on his wife 10 times a day. Maybe he was concerned. Maybe. Yeah. I could see that. Because that, I mean, that is definitely, he's in a high profile. Yes. You know. He's high risk. Yeah. And activists were trying to set fire to his clinic. Oh, geez. They were vandalizing his home. Uh, they were putting out brochures all over the neighborhood and his, at his kid's school. Oh, no. Saying wanted dead or alive. What's more is that only days before the murder, another anti-abortion group had applied for a permit to stage a protest in front of their house, which is so bizarre. You can apply for a permit to do it in front of someone's house? Yeah, I don't know that you would get the permit, but you could apply. Okay. Um, As a routine in domestic murders, the detectives would take a look at the spouse. Yeah, I mean, obviously. It's like, I swear nine times out of ten, it's like the significant other. Right. Domestic violence is a huge, yeah, huge problem. I mean, wives killing husbands too, you know. Yes, though they yeah. like to poison, not bludgeon. <laughs> women, yeah. women, women like to um, poison. So in this case, the John Hamilton had a very good alibi. He had been oh. up at dawn for a seven a.m. surgery at the outpatient clinic. It was over by eight, and afterwards, John stopped by the hospital. So he worked at two different places. Oh, okay. So he worked at the clinic and the hospital. Okay. Yes. So the hospital is where he started. The clinic was, I think, t- between 20 and 30 minutes away. Okay. Because there's a whole timeline for this thing, obviously, that the investigators are trying to figure out. Okay. Yeah. Um, because for your alibi, we have to make up for the time. Absolutely. We have to know exactly where you are. And did you have time to stop here and do this and then leave again? Exactly. Yeah. So the surgery was over by eight. And afterwards, John stopped by the hospital where he had another procedure scheduled for later that morning. At around 8.30, he bumped into his former medical partner, Dr. Karen Reisig. Mm. Reisig. So in an interview, Karen said, I had gone to the doctor's lounge to dictate the procedure, and he was in there. He was just talking on the phone, sounded like he was talking to Susan. 
just you know a very lighthearted conversation Mm -hmm. so nothing to see there um afterwards john decided to swing by the house he was only home for a few minutes because at 9 a.m his pager went off it was the hospital calling him to get back for a second surgery by 9 30 he was scrubbing up for the operation which was a complicated removal of a tumor okay uh the procedure came off without a hitch there were no issues and later, none of the doctors reported anything at all unusual in his behavior. He was just his normal doctor self. Yep. Just doing a routine procedure to remove a tumor. Complicated as it may be, he's a doctor. Right. Uh, so by 1045, he was on his way home again, which is when he says he discovered Susan in a pool of her own blood. 1045 a.m.? Yes. Okay. So the timeline was extremely tight for the doctor to even be considered as a suspect. Yeah, I could see that. Unless he did it when he went home at nine. So you have to believe that he committed the narrow murder or sorry, the violent murder in the narrow window between his two surgeries. Mm. His former medical partner, Karen, said that's impossible. She said, I personally don't believe a physician could do a surgery go commit a brutal crime of murder and then go back and do another surgery and be even in his right mind. And wouldn't he be like covered in blood or something? You would think. Yeah. And obviously I've never done surgery before, but oh I have God. to imagine it's pretty fucking hard. <laughs> I would think. Like you have to think pretty hard, right? Uh, and yeah. if you just murdered somebody like your adrenaline, even just that, unless you're a sociopath. I mean, how could you keep yourself under control? I think a sociopath could he do must it. have been. Yeah. Yeah. Um, investigators though, weren't ruling anything out, especially not after finding a Valentine's day card from Susan to John that he had opened that day. Um, Susan's friend, other Susan Johnston, uh, lived next door. And during the investigation, when they were, uh, the investigators were at the house, she pulled one of them aside and told them that the week before Valentine's day, Susan Hamilton had confided in her about problems in their marriage. She also told them about the dancer and all the calls going back and forth because she found out about the phone records and she goes and talks to her next door neighbor friend and Mm. is like, look what I fucking found. Like, what the hell? So she knew about everything. Interesting. So she tells the investigators about it. Um, Investigators have a word for rage crimes uh, in quotes overkill. Oh, yeah. So that's what continued to like bludgeon yes. or hi- anything you're doing to them long after it would it take for them to yes. die yeah because of your rage yeah and that's what had happened to susan hamilton on oh. valentine's day morning oh. whoever killed her had cracked her skull open oh poor thing with an object that was never found and bashed her face into the bathroom tile oh god two men's ties were tightly knotted around her neck and the scene was absolutely bloody horrible oh. Poor baby. And it was in their master bathroom. Jeez. Um, and while there were scenarios to seriously consider, like a crazy robber, maybe the legion of activists opposed to the couple's abortion practice, the crime scene was not telling them that. Mm-mm. Not uh, least of all, a bloody crime scene where there were no footprints leading out of the house. There was no bloody footprints leading out. No, and there was no fourth century either. Yeah. So soon after their arrival... Investigators started questioning Dr. John Hamilton. Um, By then, there had been that neighbor's tip about the problems in the Hamilton marriage. And that wasn't all. The doctor's behavior in the minutes after finding Susan dead seemed, in quotes, off. Maybe the one-armed man did it. The one-armed man? (laughs) You don't know that? What's that? Oh, my gosh. People are screaming right now. I can't believe you don't know the one-armed man. I don't know. That's from The Fugitive. Harrison Ford. He was a doctor. Is this story based on this? <laughs> he was a doctor. Based on this? I wonder if it was based on... No, I think The Fugitive came out before this. Oh. I can't remember. But anyway, yeah, no, he was a doctor and he found his wife murdered and they thought he did it. And he said, no, it was the one-armed man. And they never believed the one-armed man existed. Oh. But spoiler fucking alert, guys. If he you've did never exist. seen The Fugitive... Yeah, he did. Wow. He did exist. Okay, well, I can tell you right now, there ain't no one-armed man in this story. <laughs> There's just one creepy doctor. There's a two-armed doctor. <laughs> yeah, who's perfectly capable. So Hamilton had told, John Hamilton, had told the 911 operator that he was performing CPR. But when the first first responder, firefighter David Bradbury, arrived on the scene, 
He thought that there was something odd about the way the doctor was performing chest compressions for CPR. So David Bradbury said he had one hand on her chest and one hand on her abdomen attempting to do compressions. What the fuck? You're a doctor, dude. Yeah. He Even said, I know that's not right. He said the way that we're taught to do CPR, the palm goes on yes. the center of the chest on the sternum. Yeah. And you to think do staying alive. Exactly. <laughs> And David also said the way that this woman had been beaten, I mean, her face was swollen, her mouth was bloody. He said, I didn't notice any blood on his mouth whatsoever. So he was not giving mouth to mouth. Okay. He was giving compressions on her abdomen. And didn't she have something tied around her neck? Yeah. How would that help you? Wouldn't you have to take that off? I don't know. It didn't ever say in the notes if he took it off or not. Oh, Jesus. Or cut it off. Um, After arriving at the crime scene, investigators placed John in the back of a police car. And that was then when they noticed something else odd. Uh, The detective, Teresa Sterling, said he was acting very upset. He was scraping his knuckles on the screen, the mesh screen in the police car. Oh, yeah. That separates the front from the back. And he was banging his head into it. He was acting very bizarre. Oh, like he's so full of grief or something? I think it was um, maybe to cover up wounds that he had on his hands oh i got like maybe he was injured in the process so he's like look what i just did in this car this has nothing to do with oh wow okay and from what i can tell from the pictures of susan and also the way her friends talked about her she would not take a no shit she was not like she was not like a small like scared she wasn't a pushover no and even one of her friends was like she wore the pants in the relationships interesting she was not scared yeah so I can't imagine she didn't put up a fight at all. Oh, I'm sure she had to. Have. So, yeah. Um, so as the detectives looked more closely into the doctor's timeline, they saw a hole. Not a big one, but maybe enough time to kill and get back. They learned that the second surgery, originally scheduled for nine, had actually not started until 940. Oh. Because Dr. Hamilton was late. The surgical team was about to get started when they realized the doctor was still at home. Uh, yeah, that's a problem. And even the um, OR team said, um, not very often does it happen that somebody's under anesthesia and the doctor's not here. Yeah, like, it's how a the thing. fuck are you not showing up? Yeah, I mean, you, you got to like regulate that anesthesia thing. You don't want to keep them under there for no. too long. Well, for 40 minutes. And his house was, I think they said, 10 minutes away from the hospital and the clinic. That's plenty of time. Dude. Like he was somewhere in the middle. So like hospitals over here, his house and the clinics on the other side. Yeah, that's plenty of time. So, but everyone was on John's side. He was a super nice guy. Yeah. And they're like, even like her daughter at one point was like, really? he couldn't have done this. There's no way. There's no way. He's so nice. They were so in love. Like he has no reason to do this to her. Oh, you never know what goes on behind closed doors. I know. Um, because he was such a nice, mild-mannered guy, and they were so in love. Mild-mannered. You're so 50s. There's, uh, (laughs) they just thought there's no way he could have beaten his wife to death and then gone back to work like nothing happened. Right. But the timeline isn't right. And the blood splatter isn't right either. The defense used a bloodstain expert named Ross Gardner. And Ross Gardner said, uh, this was a relatively contained contained crime scene because it was in the bathroom Mm -hmm. a good amount of blood a lot of impact spatter so because she was being with blunt object right Mm -hmm. uh gardner carefully examined everything the doctor had been wearing that morning a lot of blood on his clothing could be explained by his attempt to administer cpr of course but the expert looked at john's shoes the left one in particular and found that to be a different manner the shoes were found next to susan's body John said they fell off of his feet while he was attempting to revive her, which is weird. That's weird as fuck. Why would your shoes fall off? I mean, unless they're like Crocs with no back or something. I don't think so. He's a fucking doctor. Yeah, that's weird. So the expert was certain that whoever was wearing that left shoe that day was present when Susan Hamilton was being bludgeoned to death. Because there was blood splatter on top of the shoe. I think it was underneath the shoe. Oh. Right? I don't know. I'm just asking. I don't know. The shoes are found. Blah, blah, blah. Where does it say that? Oh, yeah. It just says on the shoe. You're right. It's just on the shoe. Yeah. Because for I'm some reason I thought like, it was under the shoe. I'm, j- I'm just thinking like if you're standing there and like you you hit someone, if there's blood spatter on top of your mm-hmm. shoe, that means you were standing there. Yeah. 
when it happened, they're if saying you there's came no after, it would be on the bottom of your shoe. Right. So. Oh, you're right. Yeah. So that's, that's what I'm thinking. Like, I'm sorry, dude, you have, you literally have like blood splatter on the top of your shoe. That means you were standing there when this happened. Yeah. So. I mean, just call me Dexter. I'm a blood splatter <laughs> expert. Hello. I guess they watch <laughs> enough Dexter. So Ross Gardner said. Effectively, the inside and front of that shoe was in motion around the splatter event from Mrs. Hamilton that's radiating out. Oh. And the only explanation of this event is the wounding to Mrs. Hamilton. Interesting. Blood splatter experts are so interesting. I know. Like, when you li- li- listen to the science of how they figure out things, it's really cool. And, like, the tiny, tiny amounts of blood yes. they can find. And how the even how the blood drops or aspirates or... Mm-hmm. I mean, it's it's actually really cool. Yeah. Maybe it's your next career. Um, <laughs> In my next life. Uh, yeah. <laughs> I can't do chemistry. Sorry. And then <laughs> there were these curious stains on the doctor's shirt. The blood expert thought he saw a similarity between their angular shape and the wound created on Susan's head. So this theory, oh. his theory was that the stains on the shirt were left by the murder weapon as it came in contact with the garment. So like he had wiped it off or it hit oh, him. Okay. Um, of course, there wasn't an actual murder weapon because they never found it um, to make a true comparison. But he was able to leave the jury with a vivid impression. The doctor's shirt may have been. Wait. Oh. Yeah. Okay. This makes sense. The doctor's shirt may have taken a kind of photograph in the blood. Oh, okay. So I wonder what he did with that murder weapon. I don't know. He had time to ditch it. He obviously did. Um, Ross Gardner also said, we took a one-on-one image of Mrs. Hamilton's head, the injury, the laceration. We took a one-to-one image of his shirt and you overlay it and you could overlay the pattern transfer transfer right on top of the wound. And you see an immediate matchup. Oh my gosh, that's bonkers. Isn't that weird? That's very cool that they Um, were able to do that. But the most damning blood evidence of all may have been found in the doctor's car. On the steering wheel and the driver's side seat and door sill, crime scene investigators recovered strands of Susan's hair and a piece of her flesh. Oh yeah. Um, How did they get there from the bathroom? Right, especially if you found her and called that you weren't obviously not going to your car but it's a story for that too oh he does okay let's hear it fucker yeah and (laughs) actually i don't think i even wrote that one down but he does have an excuse for it um to the investigators the only plausible explanation was that the doctor had bundled up the murder weapon to dispose of it somewhere along the way as he raced back for a second surgery yep a bloody bundle that leaked yep that's exactly what he did i was gonna say he did something with it on the way back to work so his reasoning for why susan's flesh is in his car and her blood is because he said after he called 911, he was so distraught. He was waiting for the paramedics to get there. He was 100% sure she was dead. This is his reasoning. Yeah. And so he didn't want their driveway to be blocked by his Jaguar. So he went outside to move his car so that the paramedics could pull into their driveway so that they could get Susan into the, par- into the EMS faster. Okay, so... That's his reasoning. Basically, what you're saying, doctor fucker, Mm. is that you were performing CPR, you took time to go move the car, came back, and continued to do CPR because that's where they found you when they came. Yes. That is the biggest pile of bullshit I've ever heard in my life. Yes. And actually... If you're 100% that she was dead, why were you trying to perform CPR again? I think that his car wasn't even moved. His car was still in the driveway. I'm like remembering this from my reading um because he said he got out there and he was so distraught that he couldn't even get his key in the ignition like he was shaking so then he just so thought hard. i'll just go do cpr he was again. panicking so then he got out of his car and went back into the house nice story. that was how the flesh got in the car nice story yeah um oh it's so gross it creeps me out so what the word flesh just all this oh. whole thing no it's very just sad. the pieces of I her so flesh horrible in his for car. her yeah um so and i don't know why i didn't write down who this person is who? randy randy scott who who are you <laughs> well what does he say it's an interview from him oh i think he was an investigator randy okay anyway Randy Scott said, uh, you know, you wouldn't have had 
time to wash up or you wouldn't have had the time to have gotten off your clothing. He left in a hurry, obviously, the first time that he was at the house. So leaving in a hurry, that evidence gets transferred from one thing to another. I think Mm -hmm. this is the defense. That makes sense. By the time the prosecutor had wrapped up this case, he'd laid out a theory of what had happened. Oh, yeah, that was the prosecutor. Yeah. Um, That the doctor had used the neckties to pull his wife down from the ground. So he was on the ground. He used the neckties to pull her down and then bashed her head in with the murder (gasps) weapon that was never found. And afterwards, he tried to clean up, but quickly gave up because he got paged by the hospital. Fucker, you're late for your surgery. Yeah, I mean, Jesus. So, but John had an explanation for everything. We talked about some of them before. The reason he was late is because he stopped to get a card for Susan for Valentine's Day. Where's the card? And he stopped at the house to give it to her. Um, Someone had to have seen him stop for a card. And he doesn't know what happened after that until he came home and found her dead. And he tried to administer CPR and, you know, all these other things, right? As for the discovery of Susan's hair and blood tissue in his car, I did write it down. Hamilton explained it this way. After he said, after calling 911, he realized the EMTs wouldn't be able to get their ambulance past his car out front. So he raced out to move it. He said he had gotten Susan's blood on him from performing CPR, blood that had transferred from his hands and his clothes to the car. Again. Yeah, you're full of shit. Yeah. Uh, And I will tell you, the jury did not agree with Hamilton. They're like, we know you're full of shit. Oh, good, good. So there was a good jury. <laughs> yes. On January 8th, 2002, after only two hours of deliberation, oh, wow. Dr. Hamilton was convicted of first degree murder and sentenced to life in prison without the possibility of parole. Interesting. The judge expressed during his sentencing that the jury expressed their discontent with not being able to sentence him to death. They wow. thought that it should have been a capital murder, not first degree. I would agree. So they're like... We wish we could kill you. So they were all in agreement. Like, oh, yeah. Very quickly. And I also read, this is also not in my notes, the defense, when he tried to appeal, because he tries to appeal, he attempted to appeal in 2003, but he lost his bid to the Oklahoma Court of Criminal Appeals. Um, he attests that he did not get a fair trial and that the bloodstain expert, that bloodstain expert is junk science. What? And that the anti-abortion activist theory should have been investigated. That's what he stands by, that it was anti-abortion people. No. Yeah. So, uh, and actually, the one of the attorneys said, I've never seen an appeal where the defense laid out all of their good evidence. <laughs> He's like, it's all of it. There's, not, uh, there's nothing that they could even pull out wow. beyond that. They really laid it all on him. Yeah. And the jury was like, you convinced us. Oh, the prosecution later. Yeah, out. exactly. Yeah, okay. That's crazy. Well, that's it. That's my best. So he's been convicted. Did he ever, he never confessed in any way? I don't think so. No. no. So he's while and away in prison in Oklahoma. Wow. And they said, uh, no, we're not going to let you can't appeal. You're not appealing. I don't know how old her child was when that happened, but I feel so she sorry. She was in her thirties. Oh, because uh, John so Hamilton was 53 in 2001, and I think she was like 55. Oh, man. So her daughter must have been about 30. Oh, yeah. poor thing. Yeah. That's awful. I'm glad he got convicted, though. Me too. Just I'm glad like, he didn't get away what happened? Ha- yeah. Like, how did you really think that was going to work? Like, come on, dude. Oh, I don't know what happened. And then, like, they're not going to say. Yeah, you started the fucking surgery late. Like, of course, everyone noticed that you were late to surgery. They have someone under anesthesia for 40 minutes waiting for you. Yeah, and at some point you're starting to panic. Like, is he going to get here? Is he going to get here? Yeah, should we take this person out? Right. From anesthesia? That's nuts. Yeah. Wow. Well, a big fuck you. Yeah, fuck you, Johnny Dr. Hamilton. Ham- Dr. Hamilton. <laughs> I'm glad that... Um, he was caught and he was convicted. That's Damn. crazy. Poor Susan. I know. And I'll he also said it. that um, John Hamilton said that there were no, uh, there was no blood or anything under her fingernails. So they couldn't prove that. Oh, that's what he said. Yeah. Because there was no defense wounds. I guess she didn't There's have. There's not his, always blood under she someone's didn't fingernails when they defend DNA. themselves. Yeah. That's not always how it works, yeah, dummy. No. Especially if you're with someone that you basically trust, Mm -hmm. you know, and you're surprised by the attack. Yeah. And these were like, 
big houses in Oklahoma, like big rich people houses. Wow. This was not like some podunk neighborhood. This was like a fancy. Podunk. <laughs> this was like a fancy southern neighborhood. Yeah. So stuff like this did not happen. I'm surprised. Oh, I'm sure. I mean, I know her neighbor, Susan, said the conversation they had before, but I'm surprised no one saw or heard anything before that when it happened. Oh, yeah. But maybe the houses are really separated. I mean, if they're, maybe. you know, yeah, I didn't see a picture of the neighborhood or anything. I feel like a lot of like a lot of those states there, like they have the, room. Yeah. 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 Poor Susan. And they don't have any fences in their backyard, which is so weird. Yeah. Us Californians don't understand that. Like, we all have fences. So. I'm like, can I get a taller fence? I'll yeah. take a 12 foot fence. I'll take a 25 foot fence. Yeah. That- <laughs> A dome. And then you go to like, you know, the Midwest and the South or whatever. And you're like, nobody has fences. You guys like each other? Yeah. <laughs> Do you like each other? We mow each other's lawns. And... Your neighbor could just wander into your backyard. I'd be sure. like, get the hell out of here. I, mean, <laughs> I think uh, states with open backyards have guns. I, I don't think you're oh, worried about many point. people coming into your backyard. Good point. I'll just shoot you. Yeah. Because I think in Texas, <laughs> you can shoot somebody even through the door. Oh, yeah. Like, I don't think you have to be. As long as you're on their pro- you're yeah. on the property, you exactly. can do it. Yeah, which is scary. <laughs> can you imagine being like a door to door salesman in Texas? Oh my gosh! Oh my gosh! Are there still door to door salesmen? Oh yeah, there was one who came here like two days ago. I like what happened to online and call just call people. I don't go know. online. I don't He's know. always trying to do a quote. No, he's come here before. No, it's COVID. Go away. He's like, uh, do you need something fixed? And I'm like, no, I don't, bye. I don't think so stop. Yeah, my husband will do it. Yeah, I don't need we're you done. To, I don't need you here. <laughs> thank you. Well, thank you for that lovely story. Happy um, fucking Valentine's I'm Day. I'm glad it did end with him getting convicted because I wasn't sure where you're going with that one. And also the drink was fabulous. The drink was fab. And I still haven't drank all of it, but you know, I'm cheers to Susan. I'm sure cheers she was a Susan. beautiful person. She was. And I think really, really like a lot of her friends were interviewed and they really thought highly of her. That's, that's really sad. Yeah. So... Well, thank you for listening. Do you want to tell them where to find oh, yeah. us? You always forget that part. I don't know. Where's my paper? <laughs> she has no paper. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> Did you just Please. drop it? Okay. So if you want to <laughs> tell us about like a story you want to hear or a cocktail, you can email us at killerspiritspod at gmail.com. We're on Twitter at killerspirits. We're on Instagram at killerspiritspod. We're on Patreon at patreon.com backslash killerspirits. And we're on TikTok. Oh, and we're on TikTok at yeah. killerspiritspod. Yeah. So Where thank you may you. catch a drink video. Yeah. We do our fun little compilations. Yep. But yeah, definitely go to Instagram. If you have Instagram, we post pictures from the episode and yeah. our drink. Chat with us. So thank you so much for listening. Happy Valentine's Day. Happy Valentine's Day. Love you guys. Bye. Bye. Bye.